Hey guys, welcome back to the show today. We have a fantastic guest, Mike from Invictus Research. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Do you mind to give us an intro and tell us about yourself? Sure. So uh, like you said, my name is Mike Singleton. I'm the uh, senior analyst and principal at Invictus Research. Invictus Research is a provider of macroeconomic and market strategy research to individual uh, investors and financial institutions. So our clients range the gamut from people just starting to learn about how to invest and evaluate the economy and financial markets, all the way to uh, relatively sophisticated hedge fund clients. The goal of our work is really to uh, help our clients understand what's going on with the economy and what's likely to happen and how financial markets are likely to react. So think stocks, bonds, commodities, and we even do a little bit of crypto as well. And then we communicate our research largely over video. So unlike traditional Wall Street research, which is delivered over long PowerPoint presentations and PDFs, which uh, I've been on the receiving end of those and I found them very boring. Uh, our research is delivered over video, lots of intuitive uh, charts and graphs and different ways of making the research more accessible and more interesting and easier to digest than traditional Wall Street research. So uh, that's the long story short and I'm happy to double click on anything I said that sounds interesting. Yeah, sounds amazing. I mean, one of the most interesting things, at least to me, is when you think about money, most people, they don't know what money is, right? Because, I mean, we are used to a number into a bank account, which destroy itself, <laughs> aka fiat. If you don't invest your money, you're going to lose value because inflation is a real thing. And you might want to use some of those to purchase assets. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki changed my life, as well as the Bitcoin standard. Those two books I recommend every single time I record the podcast because they made me see the light, <laughs> as I call it, but it doesn't actually matter. I think that's my opinion. What do you, what do you choose to do as long as you look into the topic? Because I don't think, and I, I like to pick your brain here, but I don't think leaving money on a bank, it's a good strategy. No, I agree. So I think when you think about, so monetary economics is a shockingly complicated school of economics. I think as investors, the way that you want to think about it is, uh, uh, risk, right? Risk taking. So I think a lot of people perceive holding cash, holding fiat currency as a low risk choice relative to financial assets, relative to stocks, bonds, commodities, cryptocurrencies, whatever. But the, the truth is there is an opportunity cost in holding cash. And that opportunity cost can be higher or lower depending on the expected returns of the various risk markets and the various policies put in place by central banks and that are national governments, right? And so uh, I think when you're evaluating the attractiveness of a given currency or the currency of whatever country that you're in, that's the way that you should really be thinking about it, right? If forward returns over the next, call it 12 months or you know five years or whatever your investment time horizon is, are attractive, you wanna be holding as little currency as possible. Uh, and if they're unattractive, right? If you see significant economic or financial risk specifically economic risk, perhaps a credit event or the unemployment rate about to rise, then you want to be holding relatively more fiat currency, particularly if you're in a, a, com a, com a country with a relatively stable economic regime. Uh, there can, of, cor of course, be economic instability that's propagated by the, the national government, in which case maybe it's not such a good idea to hold the national currency as a safe haven asset. But most of our clients at Invictus, a little over 50% are US-based, and a lot of them have US dollar-based accounts. And so that's how we tend to think about it. But if you hold in US, you know, it's more stable, but still, you know, it, we're talking about, I mean, I don't know, it depends, I guess, of what's happening in the, in the macro, which we're going to dive into it. But I suppose maybe like a four or 5% a year, uh, it's possible that you lose uh, your, your wealth into. And if you leave it for 10 years, that's well, half of your entire savings, right? So you want to maybe take an approach and say, okay, maybe I don't have to go and YOLO my entire saving into a random coin or whatever, but at the same time, maybe think about a strategy and say, okay, how do I preserve my wealth? You know, how much of these I saved, I want to put into gold versus stocks versus crypto, depending on your risk tolerance and your age. And I, su I suppose there is going to be a bunch of different variables. I don't think you have one hat for everybody. You might want to assess with your clients and thinking about having, like you said, a conversation on video and say, okay, based on your situation, we can advise you to do so and so. And do you, do you see people leaning into cryptos these days? Yes, absolutely. People are, are leaning more into crypto now than, you know, at any point in the last 10 or 15 years. On cash, really quick, what I would say is if you own cash, even in a developed market, what you have to understand is that 
the central banks are targeting 2% inflation in general, which means that if everything goes well, your, your currency is going to devalue relative to goods and, cur- uh, goods and services at a rate of 2% every single year. And so in certain instances, maybe that's acceptable, but over the long run, you generally don't want to have your purchasing power devalued that way. So one alternative is to invest in stocks and the algorithm for ex- long-term expected returns for stocks is you know, GDP growth plus the dividend. And as long as a country is growing its GDP, its real GDP, or even its nominal GDP in some instances too, at a positive rate, the value of public companies should be increasing at a similar rate. So if real GDP is 3%, inflation is 2%, over the long run, you should expect companies to grow earnings at about 5%. If they're paying a 1% dividend on top of that, you should expect roughly 6% annual performance from stocks, which is a lot better than negative 2%. <laughs> from negative uh, 2% real returns from holding the currency. So that's just back to what I was saying earlier, right? You have to evaluate whatever currency you're holding against the alternatives. A big one is stocks, probably for most people. I think crypto is becoming an increasingly visible alternative. I'm not an expert in crypto. The way that, that I tend to think about crypto and Victus is from a macroeconomic top-down perspective. So what are the macroeconomic variables that tend to have the closest correlation uh, with the performance of crypto assets? And is there a logical economic or financial relationship between those variables and cryptocurrencies as an asset class? And so uh, that's a way to think about it. I'm happy to dive into that more if you'd like. You're touching some interesting points here. Well, like you said, you know, they, the feds, they think, oh, actually, let me rephrase it. The feds, they would like to keep it at 2%, but we've seen that, you know, it moves. I mean, it's a moving target. So uh, also, they give the data. I call it CPI, <laughs> but it's CPI <laughs> for for whom they want to know. And of course, you know it's been quote under control lately. And like you said, you can you can balance it with some some safer and less riskier options. I mean, you have gold, you have real estate. I mean, pff, there is so many different options. You have the stock market, of course. Uh, I think what is interesting about crypto, I mean, at least from from my perspective, is super volatile, super new. It's like a teenager. This thing has been around since 2009. So it's clearly like a, yeah, in a teenager stage, it's very risky as opposed to other stuff. And then as soon as you open the cryptocurrency door, you have a humongous amount of currencies and some are going to do some incredible returns and going nowhere in six months. Others are going to be more slow and steady, even though slow and steady, you know, talking about Bitcoin, for example, some people complain, oh, Bitcoin is too slow. 160% last year. So, you know, uh, when you say slow, it it, it, it depends compared to what, because I don't think there is anything else um, in the market. I mean, at least for the past few, few years who has gone as much. And maybe because I would like to pick your brain here, maybe because it's young and typically when an asset is new, there is more volatility into it. And as soon as it becomes more established in the market, it will stabilize itself. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, when I think about the potential for Bitcoin, I think it's very reasonable and it's sort of a base case to say, well, at least as it becomes more widely adopted, at least it'll become kind of like digital gold, right? And so the market cap of gold is something like 10 or $11 trillion. Bitcoin, I think, is half a trillion dollars or maybe it's actually gone up a bit. So maybe it's, you know, 700 or $800 billion. In any case, I mean, I think that it's very possible that in the next five years or, or 10 years, Bitcoin is a 10 or 20 bagger from here, right? It's if it just got its market cap up to the level of gold, which I think would be very reasonable. And uh, beyond that, you know, I, I'm probably not the best suited to speculate, but I think that if, if uh, you know, 10 or 20 times from here isn't enough for you, then I don't know, maybe you should, <laughs> I don't know what you need to invest in, but that, that's a pretty good return still. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, do you recommend crypto per se? Is it part of your proposition? So I think it depends on which country you're in and what, economic regime the global economy is going through. I think if you're in the US and you're going through a sort of pro-cyclical risk on uh, regime, you you do want to own cryptocurrencies because they tend to back test very well against those regimes, Uh, right? When growth is accelerated, when when the Fed is providing liquidity to the financial system, Bitcoin performs extremely, extremely well, right? So, you know, you want to be going risk on, you know, across different financial exposures, and you definitely want to have exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, Through a risk off regime, right, if you're going into a recession in the US, like, no, you probably don't want to own Bitcoin, there's going to be better performing assets, uh, including assets as boring as the US dollar, including assets as boring as, 
long-term U.S. treasuries. I think the long-term trend is that even in U.S. dollars, Bitcoin is going to be probably moving higher and substantially so. If we took a step back and we were, you know, let's say we're living in an emerging market, I think you probably want a more strategic allocation to Bitcoin, right? So, you know, if you have real currency risk in whichever country you're investing, Bitcoin isn't just a risk on exposure. It's also, you know, a store of value. And it's, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't know, maybe you would trade it more like a commodity and less like a, like a highly speculative speculative stock. It, it, it's already, in a sense, more like digital gold, I think, if you are living in, say, Turkey. So long story short, I think if you're in the U.S., it's probably more of a, a tactical allocation unless you have a very high tolerance for volatility. And if you're in an emerging market, I think you probably want to be holding Bitcoin, at least some allocation to Bitcoin most of the time. It's next to impossible to design one size to fit them all. I completely agree. And I am, of course, super into crypto, but sometimes when I stop and I think about it, and I try to kind of balloon myself down, as they say, because I, I space out quite a bit. I'm thinking as much as I, I can Michael Saylor myself and say, there is no second best, Bitcoin is going to infinite. I get it. And by the way, 99.99 of my portfolio is in crypto, so I'm already all in. But I don't think it's for everybody because to stomach it and the volatility that you see through time, it's just not for everybody, right? Especially if you need money in the short term, like taking, I think, no financial advice, of course, but taking a percentage of portfolio and put it into crypto and forget about it for 10 years is probably the best thing you can possibly do. But then that percentage, it could change from one person to another, like you said in the beginning, right? It depends on what kind of person you are, what kind of risk tolerance you want to have and what kind of money are you willing to lose potentially because, hey, you know, Bitcoin could go to nothing. It's possible, you know. I'll also add that like there are there are a million ways to skin the cat financially. And part of being a good investor is knowing where your edge is. At Invictus, we tend to focus on market timing and factor timing over a time horizon of 12 to 18 months. But there are... If, some investors that are great at picking different cryptocurrencies. Their alpha is, is literally in doing the bottom up analysis of these different tokens and such, uh, or maybe even in evaluating the long term prospects of Bitcoin. And if you're a really good analyst, you can earn alpha that way. You don't have to do it exactly the same way that we do at Invictus. But we think that no matter what your process is, overlaying a macro framework can help you better analyze and better manage risk. Yeah, I like that. I mean, do you have some sort of a blueprint, for example, you could say, okay, take 20% cash always as opposed to half on the stock, maybe some gold. Yeah, it really depends on your financial. It really, really depends on your financial goals and your risk tolerance. I mean, in general, if you're younger, you should be taking more risk. If you really want to get super rich, you have to take really concentrated bets, you know, whether that's starting your own business, whether that's investing in stocks with leverage, whether that's buying Bitcoin. Of course, your risk of ruin is very high, but your risk of ruin is very high following all those paths, right? Most small businesses fail. Uh, you could make the case it's not always a great risk adjusted bet. But of course, most of the really rich people in the world have started a business, right? Uh, there are a lot of really rich people that took very concentrated bets in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and it worked out. It's really the only way of doing it. Now, if you're 65 and you're planning your retirement, you're probably not in a place in life to take that kind of financial risk. That's why most 65 year olds aren't starting Amazon, right? They aren't in a place to go start a business either. So, you know, I think a lot of people look at crypto folks and they say, oh, they're not managing risk at all. Or, and, and it's probably true. There are probably people like that. But a lot of the people that I know that have made a lot of money in cryptocurrencies are relatively young and they're in a place in life where it does make sense to take more financial risk. I know I kind of skated around your question a little bit. But this is just to say, I think it's, it's very, very personal. And if you have a very high risk tolerance and you're relatively young and it makes sense given your investment goals, it's reasonable to take a lot of risk in crypto, especially when the economic stars are aligning, so to speak. And that's, of course, what I focus more on. And if you're older or you have, uh, you know, sort of a nest egg or you're looking to earn income, you, you should probably pursue different financial portfolios. But uh, there's no one size fits all answer, unfortunately. Yeah, I thought so. It was an impossible question to answer. So I apologize for that. I mean, I, I just want to give it a shot. And maybe there was some sort of like a 80, 20 rule where you could box people in. But, you know, it, like you said, you have to evaluate each case and talk to the person, to the investor and think about the tolerance and time frame and how much money they want to invest and, and all sorts of things. But it's good to see that companies like yours are considering crypto because it's a naughty teenager. You know, it moves a lot. It does what it wants. Some people think, oh, crypto is a class on its own. 
Yeah, but people that trade crypto, that's my opinion, are humans, which means they have emotions, greed and fear, which means they'll control the market. So as much as maybe it's correlated or not to the stock or gold or whatever, still is traded by people. When I sell my crypto, it's because someone is buying it. <laughs> so there is definitely a way to read the market. It's a bit of a wild, wild west, not many regulations. So it kind of moves based on maybe a couple of individuals doing huge transaction because it's still a small asset. If someone tomorrow tweets something, there's going to be a 20% potentially movements based on a tweet, which might be fake. So super huge risk. And I wonder, I mean, do you consider when you advise in crypto, do you consider other cryptos or are you mainly focusing on, on Bitcoin? I'd say primarily focus on Bitcoin and Ethereum. I would say that the, that Bitcoin is like the S&P 500 for cryptocurrencies, right? Like every other coin has a beta to Bitcoin. And I'd say generally speaking, when you're going through, if you're a crypto specific investor uh, or you run a portfolio that's mostly crypto, through bull markets, through economic reflations, when the Fed is stimulating the economy rather than tightening, you generally want to move out on the risk spectrum within the crypto universe the same as you would within the stock universe or within the fixed income universe. So you'd want to own, you know, relatively more altcoins and through bear markets and defensive parts of the economic cycle, you generally would want to own Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, you know, you described it as being slow earlier, but it's it, relative to other cryptocurrencies that exhibits more defensive characteristics. It's not to say it's a defensive asset by itself because it's really not, but relative to other cryptocurrencies, it does trade uh, relatively defensively. I'll tell you personally, in, in general, I'm, I'm most interested in Bitcoin, but that, that could be because I'm just not knowledgeable enough about the space. And would you consider the, let's say, the Bitcoin kind of advice into a tech kind of stock zone? Because some people are comparing, for example, crypto to the tech sector, if uh, whatever, it could be Meta, it could be Apple, if they are performing well, they also put the Bitcoin in the same bucket. So I would say at Invictus, we have a tremendous amount of respect for the market. The financial markets and what the market is telling you. And it's definitely true that cryptocurrencies and various technology exposures in the stock market tend to have a very close correlation. So what does that mean? I think what, it, what it's telling you is the market's telling you that they share important financial and economic characteristics. I'm not an expert, a bottom up expert on evaluating different cryptocurrencies and protocols and tokens and whatnot. Uh, so I can't speak to it. Although I can tell you from a high level from someone who's you know, viewing crypto from the outside, so to speak, it does seem a lot like technology. It almost seems like venture capital as a category. And, you know, Bitcoin is a little bit more mature, but, you know, a bunch of the different protocols seem to me a lot like software companies. And so the correlation suggests, yes, this is like technology. And my uh, amateur outside perspective is that it looks like technology to me too. I'm kind of looking from inside out because I, I, you know, I've been into crypto for, for quite a bit, so I can only see it from inside out, but it's interesting to see how it's been perceived from the outside quote from investors per se, because mm -hmm. sometimes I talk to people and they go, no, 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 it's rat poison, whatever, you know, they label it. It does nothing. There is nothing I can do with it. You know, I'm not interested, but I think they are missing the point. I mean, of course, like I said, I'm a DGEN all in, which is not for everybody for sure. But it's definitely an interesting point. And I think it comes, I think it comes natural at some point. You, I don't want to say have to because you don't have to, but I think you would want to explore different option, especially as soon as you have some profits coming in. Because at the end of the day, yes, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. I get it. And I'm all for it. It is okay to right. grow an asset, you know, to, to, to surf some waves. Uh, but at some point, you know, I think you want to take profit. And the bigger question I have is into what? So let's say I invested a bunch of money, I made a good return, and now what? I mean, if I keep them in crypto, they will lose 70, 80%, you know, every cycle. I mean, okay, it might stabilize and it's going up, which is positive. Like I, I never measure the top, I always measure the bottom because the bottom, is, the bottom goes up, which is great. But who knows, it's really risky. And what if tomorrow something happens and everything goes to nothing? Well, then you've lost your option to have other, other assets. So the, the, the bigger dilemma for me, and it's not for, for greed because, you know, Bitcoin is performing better than gold, better than any other thing I've seen. It's just, you know, where do you take all those gains into? You know, how do you diversify your portfolio? 
And that's a million dollar question because there is probably a, a, a rainbow of option <laughs> you can play into it. I'm sure that you've recognized this as well. There's a lot of overlap between people interested in Bitcoin and people interested in global macro style investing. And I think that's because Bitcoin is a very economically sensitive asset, which I think when you first get into Bitcoin, maybe you don't realize it because you're like, wow, this, this only goes up. And then you live through a cycle and you're like, oh, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe the market cycles do matter. <laughs> I think that most I think most Bitcoin investors should become over time macro investors and learn how to diversify into other asset classes, especially once you've, you know, won a little bit of a nest egg and you are able to live comfortably and you can take risk off the table, so to speak. And I'll also add that a lot of this, the things that make Bitcoin attractive to Bitcoin investors, you know, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin scarce supply and so on. Those things also apply to other asset classes, right? There's only one Apple. There's only one Amazon. Right. And they have a, a limited number of shares and usually really good companies are buying back their shares anyway. So you could make the case that the supply for uh, these assets is actually shrinking instead of growing. But uh, I think there's a perception among all investors. This is really an all investor problem, but also among Bitcoin investors that bad government policy means bad performance from financial assets because it's so intuitive. Right. Like the Fed is easing too much like that has to be bad or the federal government is spending too much money, that has to be bad. And it does have what I would describe as negative economic consequences, but sometimes those negative economic consequences actually benefit financial markets. So one example that I think is especially relevant right now is the US federal deficit. The federal deficit was 6% in fiscal year 2023, which is very high, especially since the unemployment rate was very, very low, right? The federal government was essentially spending money as though there was a, a recession or a war, even though there was no recession or war, there's no emergency, the government's just spending a lot of money. And so a lot of investors think, wow, that's, that's bad. And you know, the Fed's been hiking and we're gonna see a, a recession. But the reality is when the government is spending a lot of money, it's, it's you know, bad in the sense that it propagates inflation, but it's good in the sense that it keeps the labor market tighter than it otherwise would be. And in this case, probably delays a recession, which means financial markets going higher, right? It probably means better performance from stocks. And so I think that's just a principle that's important to keep in the back of your mind as an investor. You should be trying to take advantage of bad policy decisions from central bankers and federal governments, you know, by, and, and, and allocating your portfolio accordingly rather than just complaining that they made bad decisions because there's plenty of opportunity to benefit. Yeah, super well said. I mean, I, I think one of the most difficult thing, I don't know if you agree, is not even make money, is keep money. Because, you know, make money is, quote, easy, but keep them. I mean, I'm not even saying multiply them, just keep them. <laughs> That's probably one of the most hard thing. As much as for any new investor, you know, imagine someone who doesn't know anything about crypto and they don't want to come to you and they want to do it themselves. Oh, I'm going to save the money and do it myself and I'll buy whatever it is, like some random meme coin that is going to dump... <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's it's really tricky you know not just for people they have no experience in investing but also with people have experience in some areas and they don't know how to tackle other stuff i think it is possible that if you're an investor who has done one thing for maybe 10 20 years it becomes harder for you to you know jump into something new right well, i think you're right on both accounts i mean i think bitcoin probably trades up to 60k at some point during 2024 but I also think it's very natural and understandable that your risk tolerance declines as you age, right? Like when you're young and you have no money, you're willing to take a hundred percent drawdown because you can always make, it doesn't take you that long to re-earn your net worth at 24. Um, but if, you know, 40 or 60 or whatever, it, it becomes a lot more challenging. And so you don't want to take the same kind of portfolio volatility, right? When you're 24 and you, you know, you're investing $10,000, a 75% drawdown doesn't bother you. But if you have, you know, a million dollars and you're 40, a 75% drawdown will bother you a lot, <laughs> especially if you, you know, have, uh, you know, if your lifestyle is caught up to your bank account at all, which realistically for most people it has, that's why they try and earn money in the first place is that they can enjoy some of the, the nice things life has to offer. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's reasonable to want to take risk off the table at some point. And you can always, the thing that most, a lot of people don't internalize well is that you can always put risk back on the table especially when the stars align in terms of the business cycle, right? Just because you take profits, it doesn't mean that you can't take risk again afterward. Sometimes being a hodler isn't the best risk-adjusted bet that you can make. 
but yeah, I think, I, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. I think it makes total sense. Of course, if you buy and hodl for 10 years, you'll be set. I get it. I mean, you'll have, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 this is, I'm speculating. I mean, based on what happened before, it could happen again. Maybe not. But based on bond history, if history repeats or rhymes, you'll be fine. DCA money you can lose or you, you can afford to lose into Bitcoin. DCA, boom, nice and easy. Like you said, we have cycles, four-year cycles. This year is election in the US. You know, we will see... I mean, again, I don't know. I'm just speculating on what I've seen before. Uh, technically, the bottom was in a 15,000 for Bitcoin. That's what I think. It's my opinion. We'll see a nice parabolic run. The ETF might be approved tomorrow. We don't know. Uh, if it's not tomorrow, it might be March for BlackRock. There is a lot of variables on the table. And I think we'll see another run in 2025. 2024 is going to be a, a happy year as opposed to priors, which we've seen some red in the market but then again, like you said, you know, when we face the next, I mean, we will go back to the previous all-time high, I think, no, no doubt right there. From there where we go, big question mark. Nobody knows. If someone is telling you they know, they are lying <laughs> because nobody, I mean, you can do TA, you can, you can have some expertise, but no one knows. So the best thing I think, and I would like to pick your brain here, is to DCA outside of the market. So I invested at, let's say, 60K. We get to 70, I take some off, 80, some off, 90, some off, and you give yourself some targets. DCA out of the market could be one way. Uh, but the problem with that one is sometimes, for example, the previous cycle, which I was not expecting 70 to be the top, I was expecting a way larger number, maybe into the under K. Then, you know, my strategy would have started at 80,000. My cash out would have begun at 80, and I've missed the train entirely because, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen. Now, a better strategy would have been maybe to be more flexible and say, well, maybe I can look into time, into macro and into price targets as opposed to, oh, we're going we're gonna to go to 100K and I'm going to start profiting at 100K because then you are not flexible. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, when did Bitcoin peak last cycle? It was in Q1 of 2021, right? So why, why did that happen? What happened? Like, you know, why did Bitcoin peak in Q1 instead of Q2 of, or Q3 or in 2020 or whatever? Well, the answer is because economic growth peaked in Q1 of 2021, and you can track that using a bunch of different measures. But like I said, Bitcoin is a cyclical risk on assets. So when growth is accelerating, it tends to do really, really well, right? We saw Bitcoin go from 8,000 to 65,000. It's pretty good, right? And then when growth slowed, we saw it decline from 65,000 to you know 18,000 or whatever it was. You know, economic conditions in the business cycle really do matter to Bitcoin. Not coincidentally, it was also the same time that you know, non-profitable tech stocks as a category peak. So if you look at the ARK Innovation ETF or the Goldman Sachs non-profitable tech index peak, they both peaked at the same time or IPOs peaked at the same time or emerging market stocks as a category peaked at the same time. Why? Because they're all cyclically sensitive. They're all sensitive to the same macroeconomic factors. And so what that suggests, and this is validated across business cycles, if you can get the growth cycle right, if you can get the inflation cycle right, if you can get what the Fed is doing right, monetary policy, you're going to get a ton of other stuff right as well, including Bitcoin most of the time, right? You know, and you're going to be wrong sometimes, and sometimes Bitcoin will trade idiosyncratically. But generally speaking, if you get the business cycle right, you're going to get a lot of other stuff right as well. And you're going to just put the probabilities on your side, which is really always what you're trying to do when you're making investment decisions. Where do you think we are now in, in, a, in a Bitcoin, let's say, cycle? I mean, are you, are you also buying into the halving and we're going to go up uh, for a bull run? I mean, what's your view? So I, I would take it probably more from a business cycle perspective. I think that we are in a late cycle inflationary boom right now, or rather that's our outlook for the next six months or so, maybe six months to a year. And so what that means is we expect economic growth to accelerate and inflation to accelerate and monetary policy to remain stable-ish. And historically, that's a pretty good backdrop for Bitcoin. I don't think it's a new bull market. I don't think that you're going to see 10x return from here over the next two years or something. Like I said, I think Bitcoin could easily go to 60K. Maybe it could even go to you know 80K or 100K. But it's not going to be like buy, buying the bottom in 2020 or buying it in 2013 or anything like that. Uh, I think to see that kind of performance going forward, I think you're going to have to see a new business cycle, right? You're going to have to see a recession. You're going to see kind of a nasty drawdown, not just in Bitcoin, but in other cyclical assets too, like stocks. And then uh, I think that's really the time to back up the truck, so to speak, and max out your long exposure. 
to be clear, I think you should have exposure to Bitcoin right now. It is a supportive economic regime, but it's a what I call a late cycle reflationary boom. It's not a new a new business cycle. Even though the, you know there is people saying all oh, those sorts of math and previous cycles and everything, there's been also a diminishing return, right? Uh, so I think it makes sense to to expect a smaller amount of of gains for sure. But also I I don't know how you feel here, but I also feel it will also diminish the losses. So we've seen 90% corrections, 80% correction. I think if we go less high, we're going to go also maybe less low and kind of go into that stability that we were saying in the beginning. So I also think having some exposure in, in Bitcoin is a good move. Is there a number, uh, like, um, I know I'm asking another impossible question, but it would be like a 5%, 10% um, on, on average that you that you would feel comfortable in recommending? Yeah, it depends. It depends on your risk tolerance and how you're... Yeah, your life situation, how old you are. But I would say that you want to be toward the higher end of whatever your tolerance is right now, right? As opposed to the last 18 months or so, where I thought the risk reward was much less favorable. Right now it's improved. So, you know, if your if your band is zero to twenty percent, right, I would say that now you maybe you would want to be at fifteen percent. All those things, like you said, they're going to impact. Like if the Fed are going to print trillions of dollars, is going to impact asset classes, right? Because all the risk assets are going to go up. Gold is going up. Bitcoin is going up. For now, the dollar is still the reserve currency, you know, and some people are saying, oh, it's going to it's gonna stop at some point. Maybe, you know, but for now it is what it is. So we have to consider it into, into the pot because it would be crazy not to think about the macro, right? And just focusing on, it's like if, you're, if your house is on fire and you're worried about moving your teacup, you know, the old building is on fire. So as much as you can reorganize right. your, your table, the entire thing is burning. So you want to consider that. Do you think the dollar is going to continue dominating and being the reserve currency for, for much longer? I mean, what's your view on, uh, on the world reserve currency? So what I would say is I don't think that another fiat currency will be able to replace the dollar. I think that there's just too much dollar infrastructure, too much dollar payment infrastructure in place and financial infrastructure, right? Right now, I mean, if you wanna trade a currency pair, uh, you almost always have to have a dollar pair mixed in there somewhere, right? Like if you wanted to convert your South African Rand into the Great British Pound, you have to convert it into dollars before you can convert it into anything else. And the reason is because the US has really deep liquid capital markets. And in essence, the US economy is large enough relative to the global economy that it can support um, you know, a global fiat currency and global debt markets. And you can make the case that that's not sustainable, right? Like the U.S. has run huge trade deficits for a long time. It's run huge budget deficits for a long time. So maybe it's not sustainable. But the truth is no one else can do it, right? And if the U.S. can't do it, who's going to step in and do it? Is there going to be a rising power that's substantially larger than the U.S. is now relative to the global economy? I mean, that's you're making a huge bet, a huge improbable bet if you're saying that's the case. There has to be some sort of technology. My, my guess is that what will replace the dollar will be some sort of technology enabled currency, maybe something in crypto, uh, not another fiat currency. If someone else has another idea or another option, well, people have to trust it and adopt it and buy it. So this is what I also think right. we see most of the struggle. I mean, some people are saying, oh, 120 years for a currency is the cap and history, blah, blah. You know, the US has been there, has been the foundation of the world economy. U.S. asset, U.S. dollar denominated assets are globally appealing to investors from treasuries to U.S. real estate to U.S. stocks. Everyone just wants to own them. I mean, I mean, the global investor class wants to own them, right? So if you own U.S. dollars or if you own any currency, you need to think, what can I do with this currency? Otherwise, it depreciates at 2% a year, like we were saying earlier, or faster. So you need to be able to invest it in something. You have like you have to be able to invest it in treasuries. You have to be able to invest, and treasuries are the most important, right? The global fixed income markets are the largest and most important markets for global investors. But the fact that the US has a great stock market and a relatively free competitive economy that has been very high performing relative to the rest of the world and attractive real estate and you know a bunch of other attractive qualities is part of why the dollar system is what it is. I mean, if you, if you were a global central bank and you were thinking, I'm gonna take uh, 500 billion dollars and turn them into you know euros or whatever. You'd have to find European or euro-denominated assets that you think are 
more appealing than dollar denominated assets. And generally yields in Europe are lower and European equities are, you know, lower performing. And the European Union has all kinds of economic challenges that are unique to being a monetary union without a fiscal union. And but you could make that same case about any any other country, right? If you were investing in the Chinese yuan, what are you going to do with all those Chinese yuan reserves? You have to invest them into something. And uh, there's just no alternative. I don't know. There's no liquid capital market with attractive yields that competes with U.S. U.S. capital markets. So, you know, until there's a reasonable alternative, maybe it's something crypto related. I just don't know where all that global money goes besides the dollar. You can reach Mike through the website, link in the comment down below. We have a variety of different research products. Almost all of them are delivered over video. We have a few courses. Probably our flagship product is the Daily Edge, which is a five to 10 minute video delivered right to your inbox every day. It covers the major economic data from the day before, the major market moves and puts them in the context of the business cycle. No alarmism, no uh, you know crazy newspaper headlines. The goal is to take the economic data that came out, put it in context, see how it should affect your portfolio positioning on the margins. And, uh, and also because it's delivered over video, hopefully it's more digestible, more accessible, and uh, all around a better product than another PDF or PowerPoint deck sent into your inbox every morning. That's the long story short. You can also find us on at uh, Twitter at Invictus Macro. And Mike, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, honestly. Oh, so, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Mauricio. Very nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> Cheers. Um.